coming out on this Wednesday evening. My name is Alan Levine. I'm a professor in the Department of Government here at AU, and I'm the director of the Political Theory Institute that is hosting tonight's activities. I'd just like to begin with a few quick announcements um, of, of three things. We have two uh, academic events left this semester. Um, First, we have an essay contest with a $500 cash prize. Right, does that have your attention? Uh, it is the, the contest uh, deadline is this Monday. So you still have uh, a weekend. Um, and it's for the best essay on classical liberalism. This is not an agenda. It's a topic. Right, so any theme, author uh, related to classical liberalism, or uh, something on the United States, American political thought, would be fine. Um, it's, some, it's okay if it was written for a course, or if you wrote it just for the essay contest. Either way, it should be between 5 and 20 pages, uh, and uh, due in my office, which is Ward 220, uh, Monday by 5. There is more on our uh, on the PTI website. There's a tab for the essay contest, and you can get more information there. And our last uh, academic event of the year is on Friday, April 25th, a week from Friday. And it's Mark Blitz, professor of uh, politics at Claremont University, who also was at one point a very high-ranking State Department official. Mm -hmm. And he is going to be giving a lecture on politics and responsibility. I don't know which side he's coming down there. <laughs> and, uh, and lastly, uh, this summer, I'm teaching a course on the politics of human trafficking. It's a two-week course that we'll be meeting in Thailand for, for two weeks, July 14th through 28th. So if there's anyone who's interested in that, it's listed as a Department of Government course. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, you can contact me. But we are gathered here this evening to reflect on the big questions of politics and the arts. What is art? What is its place in human life? What can and should it do? What can and shouldn't it do? Of course, the role of art varies from place to place and epoch to epoch. But is there any standard by which art can be judged that transcends the mere accidents of who has power in any particular society? Or is art just a tool of the ruling class? The question of judging art is almost as old as Western civilization itself. In Plato's Republic, Socrates argues that justice and goodness require that artists be regulated. He does not allow them to simply express themselves, to be creative no matter what. He argues that creativity is less important than justice and the good, and that the artist's creative impulses must bow before justice and the good. That is, if one wants to live in a just and good society. For Plato, justice and the good were known by the philosopher. And Plato's work led to the everlasting quarrel between philosophy and poetry, or philosophy and the arts. <coughs> but in a democratic age such as ours, is there any, any agreement on what standard can be used to judge the just and the good? We rather privilege individual freedom and individual expression. And Given the quality of the art in our society, on TV and the movies and popular music and videos and salacious magazines and pornography, one wonders if we're better off for it. Should art have a specific function or role in liberal democracies? Should it be used to promote pluralism or the interests of minorities or the oppressed? Is this merely political function of art compatible with promoting the highest human goods and aspirations that art sometimes aspires to do. Now, this is the second time in my career that I've entered the quarrel between philosophy and the arts. I once was asked to uh, be a bridge in a conference 
that was half artists and half aesthetic philosophers talking about art. I decided to speak about the Nigerian writer Chino Achebe, an artist who thought that art should have a serious moral purpose. And I raised two questions about whether the artists in the room had a moral intention or whether they should. The artist went ballistic at my even raising the question that something, anything, should restrict them, and they accused me of being a fascist. <laughs> Probably not the only time I've been accused of that, <laughs> but of being a fascist for raising a question. That's all I was doing, raising a question. Well, tonight I don't want to be called a fascist again, so neither of our speakers is an artist. <laughs> <laughs> but they are two eminently qualified people to talk about the role of art in human life. Now, the format for this evening's uh, uh, program is that each of them will talk for about 25 minutes, then they'll talk to each other uh, for 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll take Q&A from the floor, and we have a microphone against the far wall, so uh, at the time, when the time comes, I'll ask people to line up at the microphone. There are plenty of seats up front if people are, are looking for a seat. But first, I'll give a short introduction of them both. Roger Kimball is one of the country's preeminent cultural critics. He's taught at Yale and Connecticut College, but now he does his commenting as the editor and publisher of the new Criterion, as president and publisher of Encounter Books, as art critic for National Review, and as a columnist for PJ Media's Roger Rules. He lectures widely and has appeared on national radio and television programs, as well as the BBC, and has published essays in most of the top newspapers and intellectual journals in the United States and the United Kingdom. Roger Kimball's latest book is The Fortunes of Permanence, Culture and Anarchy in an Age of Amnesia. <coughs> He's also the author of The Rape of the Masters, Lives of the Mind, The Use and Abuse of Intelligence from Hegel to Wodehouse, Art's Prospect, The Challenge of Tradition in an Age of Celebrity, the Long March, How the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s Changed America, Experiments Against Reality, The Fate of Culture in the Postmodern Age, and his uh, extremely uh, popular and controversial Tenured Radicals, How Politics Has Corrupted Our Higher Education. That's your higher education. Kimball has served on the Board of Advisors of the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History, the Board of Visitors and Governors of St. John's College, Annapolis, and Santa Fe, and Transaction Publishers. He currently serves on the Board of the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research. Farhan Garfani is one of the most popular professors here at American University. He's what? Is that what I say? What? <laughs> That was a one of love. <laughs> He's an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy and Religion here, and a research associate at the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University in South Africa. His areas of specialization include continental philosophy, political philosophy, and aesthetics. He's the author of two books, Iranian Cinema and Philosophy, Shooting Truth, and the aesthetics of autonomy, recur and Sartre on emancipation, authenticity, and selfhood. He's the editor of Paul Ricoeur, uh, uh, 1913 to 2005, honoring and continuing the work. And he has two forthcoming books, Not Without My Daughter, Against Moderate Political Islam and Other Eurocentrism, and Demanding Cosmopolitanism, Recounting the Arab Spring. He's also published articles and book chapters on Marx, Machiavelli, Rousseau, Tocqueville, Hegel, Kierkegaard, Sartre, Ricoeur, Lacan, Levinas, Laporte, Merleau Ponty, Dickinson, Beckett, Iranian cinema, and <laughs> the politics of boredom. But I think you will uh, agree that they're both eminently qualified for our topic tonight the role of the arts. So our first speaker will be Roger King. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. 
Mr. Vine. Uh, delighted to be with you here tonight. Uh, had I heard Professor Levine's uh, introduction, I <coughs> decided to talk about Plato, but uh, I haven't heard it, so I'm only going to uh, talk about the big questions he, he mentioned. Um, what is art? What is its place in human life? What can and should it do? What can or shouldn't it do? Should it have a function or role in liberal democratic societies? So um, uh, if you don't mind being here for a few days, do you? <laughs> well, I, I could never, I think, transform all of those question marks into declarative periods, no matter how much time I had. But I hope that our discussion tonight will at least uh, leave you with the sense that these questions are not just questions on a page, but are living questions, things that actually uh, matter to you, not just academic playthings. So let's start, let's start with the definitional uh, issue. What, what is art? Now, as you can imagine, a lot of ink has been spilled over that question. But I propose basically to leave it to one side. Why? Because these days the question of what is art is haunted by another question. What is it? Artists today can literally package their own excrement as Piero Manzoni did in the early 1960s and then successfully foist off the product on a credulous public. Manzoni's own original shipment was 90 cans of 30 grams each, produced, I hope, although I don't know the details, over several days at least. <laughs> the last sale that I know about came in 2008 when a can of the stuff went for nearly 100,000 pounds to a lucky auction go goer at Sotheby's. The Tate Modern in London used to have three cans of Manzoni's masterpiece, but one exploded. So I think they're down to two. <laughs> my point is, my point is that while there may be interesting epistemological and sociological questions involved in the, the question, what is art? If our primary interest is aesthetic, is the aesthetic substance of art, then I suspect we are well advised to adopt Andy Warhol's cynical formulation that art is what you can get away with. But what about Professor Levine's other questions? In a way, they all revolve around the question, why do we care about art? That we care is pretty obvious, I think. It's graven in the stones of our museums, theaters, and concert halls embossed on the pages of our novels and volumes of poetry, enshrined in the deference, financial, social, and spiritual, that the institutions of art demand in our society. But why? Art satisfies no practical need. It is not useful in the sense in which a law court or a hospital a farm or a machinist uh, shop is useful. And yet, we invest art and the institutions that represent it with enormous privilege and prestige. Why do we do this? Why is something apparently useless accorded such honor? Well, one reason, of course, is that utility is not the only criterion of value. <laughs> We care about many things that are not in any normal sense useful. Indeed, for many of the things that we care most about, the whole question of use seems peculiarly out of place, a kind of existential category mistake. But still, we can ask, what is it about art in particular, about aesthetic experience, that recommends itself so powerfully to our regard? Probably many things. And I think we all know what the, tra 
traditional answers are that art ennobles the spirit, that it elevates the mind, educates the emotions, and so on. The 19th century German philosopher Friedrich Schiller wrote a, a little book called Letters on the Aesthetic Education of Man, enormously influential on, on later philosophers, both uh, left and right. Where in, in this little book, he argued, based on some hints from Immanuel Kant and his description of aesthetic judgment, that the experience of the beautiful, especially in the fine arts, was essentially humanizing, civilizing uh, experience because of the sense of wholeness that it gave. But let's think about the arts today. Think about Signor Manzoni. In fact, there's a tremendous irony, I think, that attends our culture's continuing investment in art emotional investment, the financial investment, the social investment. Given the oppositional and transgressional, transgressive character of so much contemporary art, we continue to behave as if art were something special, something important, something spiritually refreshing. But when we canvass the art world, and we look around at the name artists today, we try to take the, uh, have a sort of fever chart of the art world, its metabolism, what do we find? Consider, just to take one example, the case of one Jonathan Yegi. I, met, I pick him because probably you don't know him, but he's typical. When he was a student at the San Francisco Art Institute, he performed a piece called Art Piece Number One on an open air stage in front of some 20 fellow students, two professors, and various passers-by. Now, the full details of this performance are too loathsome to merit description here. Suffice it to say that in the words of an associated press wire story, it, quote, involved unprotected oral sex and the exchanging of excrement with a bound and gagged classmate, end quote. The extreme repulsiveness of Jonathan Yegi's behavior not to mention the health hazard it posed, burned him a few headlines. Within a couple of days, there was a story in the San Francisco Examiner uh, that epitomized, I think, the hoary liberal response under the headline, quote, shocking art, a venerable tradition. Now, I think it's worth pausing to consider those scare quotes around the word shocking. Are they meant to suggest that Mr. Yagi's behavior was not shocking? What is going on here, the writer of that story told us, is, quote, part of a long and rich tradition. And right on cue, he wheeled out Edward Monet's Olympia. Defenders of the so-called cutting edge he always seem to cite that nude by Manet. Never mind that Manet's painting was a technical masterpiece and was at least as shocking in formal terms as it was in content. Mr. Yegi's performance, in contrast, was merely an exhibition of sexual psychopathology leavened, bo leavened by bad boy bravado. Nevertheless, the writer of the examiner's story firmly embraced the embarrassing logical solecism that because some great art of the past has been shocking, Everything that manages to get itself called art, and is also shocking, must therefore be great. It's like concluding that because most of the saints were poor, most of the poor are saints. Now the very existence of phenomena like art piece number one tells us something about our culture, I think. The fact that such a piece should have been offered as part of a course in art at a reputable school tells us something about what has happened to our conception of art and to our educational institutions. And the fact that writers for reputable newspapers respond by defending such displays, by marshalling the rhetoric of innovation and transgression, tells us something about the state of contemporary criticism. 
The reporter for the San Francisco Examiner was right about one thing, though. Mr. Yegi's performance, though disgusting, was not really new. Indeed, recourse to the repellent has become a stock in trade of certain artists, at least since surrealism. We've all seen it before countless times. The pornography, the pathological fascination with decay and mutilation, the toying with, with blasphemy dressed up sometimes as uh, a new religiosity. The fact that performances like Mr. Yegi's art piece number one do not challenge established taste. To a great extent, they are established taste. Such phenomena are a dime a dozen these days. They fill the special exhibition of galleries of virtually every art museum in the world. Remember, to take just one example, Sensation, the infamous exhibition of British art that appeared at the, British, at the Brooklyn Museum about a decade ago. Remember the portrait of the Virgin Mary festooned with uh, cutouts from pornographic magazines and clumps of elephant dung. Remember the pubescent female mannequins studded with erect penises, vaginas, and anuses, fused together in various postures of sexual coupling, or the portrait of a child molester and murderer made from what looks like a child's handprints, or Damien Hirst's bisected animals in plexiglass full of formaldehyde. To an extent that is frightening to contemplate, I think, performances like art piece number one and exhibitions like Sensation represent the new salon. <clears throat> the taken for granted taste of the art establishment. <clears throat> they have all the gestures of the avant-garde and they have all the conformity of the salon. It used to be that the salon looked to the past and resisted aesthetic innovation. The salon of today insists on the appearance of innovation and forgets the past. Again, the situation is not new. On the contrary, we have been living with the consequences of the vertiginous fact that anything can be art, at least since the Dadaist crusader Marcel Duchamp, when he unveiled his ready-mades and impishly offered them to the public as works of art. What then? How different is that from what, is, what happens today? <coughs> but there are, I think, some important differences between then and now. Duchamp's courageousness oscillated, be outrageousness, not courageousness, his outrageousness oscillated between the banal and the shocking. One day, he would come up with an ordinary bottle rack or a snow shovel, and the next day with a urinal, which back in those innocent times did seem shocking. Either way, the art public widely considered Duchamp's activities outrageous. Moreover, Duchamp meant them to be outrageous. We sometimes forget that the professed aim of Dada was not to extend art, but to explode, to destroy the whole category of art and aesthetic delectation. But something unexpected happened. Dada set out to destroy art. It wound up being just another example. I threw the bottle rack and the urinal into their faces as a challenge, Duchamp noted contemptuously some years later, and now they admire them for their aesthetic beauty. Duchamp, of course, then gave up doing all this and devoted himself to chess. Now, Duchamp's they back then was not the public, not, not yet, but it was tastemakers and the so suitably enfranchised members of an ever-growing congregation art world. Duchamp's own motives were, to put it mildly, mixed. But his exasperation is understandable. Looking back at the unfolding of avant-garde culture, we see that the remarkable thing was not really the phenomenon of Dada. At bottom, that was just one of many late romantic expressions of nihilistic Weltschmerz. What was remarkable was its quick certification as a legitimate form of artistic expression. Dada is now an academic and museological topic of impressive pedigree, the subject of exhibitions and monographs and doctoral dissertations. What happened to Dada set an ominous precedent, I think. 
Among other things, it demonstrated the extent to which the outrageous can be trivialized by being institutionalized and assimilated into the predictable cycle of museum exhibitions, curatorial safekeeping, and critical commentary. To be sure, every now and then, a Robert Maplethorpe or an Andre Serrano or a Damien Hirst or a Jeff Koons will come along to inspire a little frisson of anxiety and unhappiness. Yet really, what is most striking about such figures is not how controversial they are, or were, but rather how quickly they are docketed and filed away as certifi certifiable examples of contemporary art, and even, if we are to believe some of the commentators, great contemporary art. When we look around the, the contemporary art scene, we are struck not only by this promiscuous nature, by the fact that it is a living illustration of the proposition that anything can count as art today, but also by a certain telltale symptoms. I believe that these symptoms tell us a great deal, not only about the character of contemporary art, but also about the character of contemporary culture, about what we value, what we aspire to, who we believe we are as human beings. It's not, I think, a flattering portrait. In the first place, there is the issue of novelty. Anyone looking at the art world today cannot fail to be struck by its obsession with novelty. For those enthralled to the imperatives of the art world, the first question to be asked of the given work is not whether it is any good, but whether it represents something discernibly new or different. Of course, the, the search for novelty has long since condemned its devotees to the undignified position of naively recirculating various cliches. How little, really, our cutting edge artists have added to the strategies of the Dadaists, the Futurists, and the Surrealists. But the appetite for novelty, even if it is the result um, even if the result is only the illusion of novelty, is apparently stronger than the passion for historical self-awareness. Never mind that the search for novelty is itself one of modernity's horriest maneuvers. For the uh, susceptible souls, its siren call is irresistible. A second and related symptom is the art world's addiction to extremity. To extreme gestures. This follows as a natural corollary to the obsession with novelty. As the search for something new to say or do becomes ever more desperate, artists push themselves to make extreme gestures simply in order to be noticed. But here too, an inexorably self-defeating logic has taken hold. At a time when so much art is routinely extreme and audiences become inured to the most brutal spectacles, authoritative uh, backdrop of normal, extreme gestures, stylistic, moral, political, degenerate into a grim species of mannerism. Lacking any guiding aesthetic imperative, such gestures, no matter how shocking or repulsive they may be, are so many exercises in futility. It is in part, I think, to compensate for this encroaching futility that the third symptom, the desire to marry art and politics, has become such a prominent feature of the contemporary art scene. When the artistic significance of art <clears throat> is at a minimum, politics rushes in to fill the void. From the crude political allegories of a Leon Golub or a Hans Hacke to the feminist sloganeering of Jenny Holzer, Karen Finley, or Cindy Sherman, much that goes under the name of art today is incomprehensible without reference to its political content. Indeed, in many cases, what we see are nothing but political gestures that poach on the prestige of art in order to enhance their authority. Another word for this activity is propaganda. Although at a moment when so much of art is given over to propagandizing, the word seems inadequate. It goes, I think, without saying that the politics in question are as predictable as clockwork. 
not only are they standard items on the prevailing tablet of left-wing pieties, they are also cartoon vi versions of the same. It's the political version of painting by number. AIDS, the homeless, gender politics, the third world, and the environment line up on one side with white hats, while capitalism, patriarchy, the United States, and traditional morality and religion assemble yonder in black hats. The trinity of novelty, extremity, and politics, leavened by a frantic commercialism and the cult of celebrity, goes a long way toward describing the complexion of the contemporary art world, its statishness, its constant recourse to lurid images of sex and violence, its tendency to substitute a hectoring politics for artistic ambition. It also helps us put into perspective some of the changes that have taken place in the meaning and goals of art over the last hundred years or so. Closely allied to the search for novelty is a shift in, of attention away from beauty as the end of art. From the time of Cubism, at least, most advanced art, which is not necessarily synonymous with good art, has striven not for the beautiful, but for the more elliptical qualities, above all, perhaps, for the interesting, which in many respects has usurped beauty as the primary category of aesthetic delectation. When was the last time you heard a serious critic describe a painting as beautiful? Interesting, challenging, transgressive, sure. Beautiful, probably not so often. At the same time, most self-consciously avant-garde artists have displayed considerably less interest in pleasing or delighting their viewers than in startling, shocking, or even repelling them. Not for nothing are challenging and transgressive among the most popular terms of critical praise today. The idea, of course, is that by abjuring beauty and refusing to please, the artist is better able to confront deeper, more authentic, more painful realities. And perhaps he is. But one mustn't overlook the element of posturing that often accompanies such existential divigation. Nor should one forget the many counterexamples and counter tendencies. In a famous statement from 1908, when he was almost 40, Henri Matisse wrote that he dreamt of an art uh, that was an art of balance, of purity and serenity, devoid of troubling or depressing subject matter, an art which could be for every, for every mental worker, for the businessman as well as the man of letters, something like a good armchair which provides relaxation from physical fatigue. Now, Matisse was one of the greatest and also one of the most innovative painters of the 20th century. Does this vision of balance and serenity diminish his achievement? Can you imagine a contemporary artist writing something like that? To a large extent, I think, the calamities of art today are due to the aftermath of the avant-garde, to all those adversarial gestures, poses, ambitions, and tactics that emer emerged and were legitimized in the 1880s and 1890s flowered in the first half of the last century, and have lived on in the kind of posthumous existence now in the frantic twilight of postmodernism. In part, our situation, like the avant-garde itself, is a complication or a perversion of our romantic inheritance. The elevation of art from a didactic pastime to a prime spiritual resource the self-conscious probing of inherited forms and artistic strictures, the image of the artist as a tortured oppositional figure, all of these things achieved first maturity and romanticism. These themes were exacerbated as the avant-garde developed from an impulse to a movement and finally into a tradition of its own. The problem is that the avant-garde has become a casualty of its own success. Having won battle after battle, it gradually transformed a recalcitrant bourgeois culture into a willing uh, collaborator in its raids on established taste. But in this victory were the seeds of its own irrelevance. For without credible resistance, its oppositional gestures degenerated into a kind of aesthetic buffoonery. 
In this sense, the institutionalization of the avant-garde spells the depth, or at least the senility, of the avant-garde. Well, what do we do about this? For one thing, it is time that we recognize that art need not be adversarial or transgressive in order to be good or important. In this context, it is worth noting that great, the great damage that has been done, above all to artists, but also to public taste, by romanticizing the tribulations of the 19th century avant-garde. Everyone is brought up uh, on stories of how an obtuse public scorned Manet and censored Gauguin and drove poor Van Gogh into madness and suicide. But the fact that these great talents went unappreciated has had the undesirable effect of encouraging the thought that because one is un unappreciated, one is therefore a genius. It has also made it extremely difficult to expose fraudulent work as such. For any frank dismissal of art, especially art that cloaks itself in the mantle of the avant-garde, is immediately met by the rejoinder, ah, but they made fun of Cezanne, too. They thought that Stravinsky was a charlatan. This is the easiest and also the most shallow response to criticism. It is yet another version of what the philosopher David Stowe called the, they all laughed at Christopher Columbus argument. The idea that we ought to welcome all innovations, moral, scientific, artistic, whatever, because all improvements in human life have come about as a result of some such new beginning. That's what the Columbus argument uh, says. The rub, of course, is that uh, it works the other way, too. Uh, as Stove observed, someone first had to make a new departure for any change for the worse ever to have taken place. And life being what it, what it is, society being the complicated thing that it is, most innovations are going to be innovations for the worse. Now, this is perfectly obvious, I think, and it is reason enough to regard innovators with caution, to say the least. If the Columbus argument is puerile when applied to politics and morals, it is equally puerile when applied to art. In the first place, most artists whom we now associate with the 19th century avant-garde did not set out to shock or transgress moral boundaries. There are exceptions, but most did not. They set out to make art that was true to their experience of the world. Today, the primary, often it seems, the only goal of many so-called cutting-edge artists is to shock and transgress. The art itself is secondary, a license for bad behavior. There's also the uncomfortable and unegalitarian truth that in any age, most art is bad or failed art. It's just the way it is. And in our time, most art is not only bad, but also dishonest. It's a form of therapy or political grumbling masquerading as art. Like everything important in human life, art must be judged on the basis of first-hand experience. No formula can be devised prescribing its assessment, including the formula that what is despised today will be championed as great art tomorrow. The art world today remains <coughs> retains little of the idealism that permeated romanticism, but it remains romantic, I think, in its moralism and hubris about the salvific properties of art. Still, the question remains, where did we go wrong? What are we missing in the contemporary art world? Doubtless, the list is a long one. But if one had to sum up volumes in a single word, a good candidate, I think, would be beauty. What the art world is lacking today is an allegiance to beauty. Now, I know that that sounds both vague and portentous, but surely we have a very curious situation today. Traditionally, the goal of fine art was to make beautiful objects. Beauty itself came with a lot of platonic and Christian metaphysical baggage, some of it indifferent or, in some cases, even positively hostile to art. But art without beauty was, if not exactly a contradiction in terms, at least a description of failed art. At the beginning of his book on modern art, the great German art historian Julius Smyrgrafa defines painting as, quote, the art of charming the eye by means of form 
of uh, color and line, and sculpture as the art of charming the eye by means of form and space. Now, when was the last time you heard someone talk about art charming the eye? And yet, until quite recently, until the day before yesterday almost, that specifically aesthetic pleasure was seen as being central to art. Aquinas defined beauty as it quad reason plotted, that which being seen pleases. Still laboring under the aftermath of the avant-garde, much art today has abandoned that ambition to please. Uh, and instead, it seeks to shock, to discommode, to repulse, to proselytize, or to startle. Beauty is out of place in any art that systematically discounts the aesthetic. Of course, beauty itself is by no means an unambiguous term. In degenerate form, it can mean the merely pretty. But how different is something like Rilke's idea of beauty in the first Duino elegy, where he says, beauty is only the beginning of a terror we can just barely endure, and what we admire is its calm, disdaining to destroy us. Or think of Dostoevsky's contention in the Brothers Karamazov that beauty is the battlefield where God and the devil war for the soul of man. Think about what that means. And the point is, in its highest sense, beauty speaks with such great immediacy because it touches something deep within us. Understood this way, beauty is something that absorbs our attention and delivers us, if but momentarily, from the poverty and incompleteness of everyday life. At its most intense, beauty invites us to forget our subjection to time and imparts an intoxicating sense of self-sufficiency. It has, as one philosopher put it, the savor of a terrestrial paradise. This is the source of beauty's power. It both dislocates, freeing us for a moment from our usual cares and concerns, and it enraptures seizing us with delight. Now I would submit that art that loses touch with the resources of beauty is bound to be sterile. But it is also true that striving self-consciously to embody beauty is a prescription for artistic failure. That may seem paradoxical, but like so many the important things in life, genuine beauty is achieved mainly by indirection. In this sense, beauty resembles happiness, as it was described by Aristotle. It is not a possible goal of any of our actions, but rather the natural accompaniment of actions rightly performed. Striving for happiness in life, all that guarantees unhappiness, just as striving for beauty in art, is likely to result in kitsch or some other artistic counterfeit. <clears throat> the trick for artists, then, is not to lose sight of beauty, but to concentrate primarily on something else, something more pedestrian, namely the making of good works of art. The best guides to this task are to be found not in the work of this season's art world darlings, but in the models furnished by the past. Although this lesson is rejected and ridiculed by the art world today, it is something that the tradition affirms again and again and again. We live at a time when art is enlisted in all manner of extra artistic projects, from gender politics to the green, grim linguistic leftism of the neo-Marxists, the post-structuralists, the gender theorists, and all the other exotic fauna who are congregating in and about the art world and the academy today. The subjection of art and of cultural life generally to political ends has been one of the great spiritual tragedies of the age, in my opinion. Among much else, it has made it increasingly difficult to appreciate art on its own terms as affording its own kinds of insights and satisfaction. This situation has made it imperative for critics who care about art to champion its distinctive aesthetic qualities against the attempts to reduce art to a species of propaganda. At the same time, however, I believe that we lose something important in our conception of art does not have room for an ethical dimension. That is to say, if the politicization of art is constricting, so too, in a different way, is a purely aesthetic conception of art, art for art's sake. By the 19th century, art had long been free from serving the ideological needs of religion. 
And yet the spiritual crisis of the age tended to invest art with ever greater existential burdens, burdens that continue in various ways to be felt down to today. The poet Wallace Stevens articulated uh, one important strand of this phenomenon when he observed that after one has abandoned the belief in God, poetry is that essence which takes its place as life's redemption. Now the idea that poetry, that art generally, should serve as a source, perhaps the primary source of spiritual sustenance in the secular age, is a romantic notion that continues to resonate powerfully even today. It helps to explain, for example, the special aura that attaches to art and artists, even now, even that is at a time when poseurs like Serrano and Bruce Nauman and Gilbert and George are accounted serious artists by persons one might have had reason to think uh, uh, would, would, would not say, say such things. The romantic inheritance has also figured with various permutations in much avant-garde culture. We have come a long way since Dostoevsky could declare that, quote, incredible as it may seem, the day will come when man will quarrel more fiercely about art than about God. Whether that trek has described a journey of progress is perhaps an open question. But this much, I think, is clear. Without an allegiance to beauty, art degenerates into a caricature of itself. It is beauty that animates aesthetic experience, making it so seductive. But aesthetic experience itself degenerates into a kind of fetish or idol if it is held up as an end in itself, untested by the rest of life. To put it another way, the trivialization of outrage leads to a kind of moral and aesthetic anesthesia, not the least of whose symptoms is the outrage of trivialization. Thanks. I am I'm almost I'm almost tempted to say that if it weren't being, this, being too difficult that the question can't be posed in terms of liberal democracies and the arts. But I'm grateful for the invitation, so I'll go along with the question I suppose. I think that the greatest danger of politics and the arts, 
as it happens in liberal democracies, is a liberal democracy is terrible for the arts. Art would do great in terms of beauty, in terms of its own inspirations, in terms of its aesthetic requirement. If it effectively did not try to do any politics, <coughs> in any shape or form, as in, if the shape or forms, in formalist terms, just to provoke beauty, just to provoke aesthetic sensations, were the issue. In fact, art need not in any way be part of politics. And I suspect that there are many artists to do that. The problem seems to be the famous artists, the ones who do try to get more attention. <coughs> many people seem to have the experience of beauty as a private experience. But it is the public discourse that seems to be demanding something extravagant, something cutting edge, something, in fact, that is novel. The paradox here, and I emphasize the liberal democracy part, because I think art has this difficult relationship with all politics, but at times, particularly in non-democratic societies, you have phenomenal arts emerging. It's not a coincidence. Alan was kind enough to mention my book on Iranian cinema. Iran had terrible cinema before the Iranian revolution. Absolutely horrible. Just about like anything Hollywood can produce, a little bit with worse production. But that's it as predictable, as uninteresting, unprovocative. Now it's considered one of the top two or three national cinemas, as they're called in the world. Some of my favorite writers, be it Dostoevsky, a lot of, or Marquez, 100 Years of Solitude. But a lot of good art doesn't seem to be produced in democratic times. One could say that democracy is also great, that artists have nothing left to say except apparently literally can themselves in parts to sell. <laughs> if that's the case, that's probably the problem with the artists, not so much democracy. The reason I think that art and democracy have a difficult relationship, it goes well beyond anything Plato envisioned. If we were to do the Platonic thing of hold one absolute truth, then the artist would rebel, and the poets would write, and through beauty they would say things. In democracy, on the contrary, we have flattened that, and as I was listening to Mr. Kimball, I kept thinking we are very much in agreement, and I would like to blame symbolically, but the one thing I hate the most these days in life, Yelp. 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 The problem is not as much the critics. I have read critics who actually use the word beautiful. You didn't know Yelp? I do now. <laughs> I am so sorry to have done this. <laughs> Is there anybody else here who didn't know Yelp? Please raise your hand. We won't be ashamed. <laughs> Two. Okay. Three. <laughs> okay. So Yelp. I thought it was a universal office. <laughs> the reason Yelp, I mention it, well, there are personal reasons on top of it. Yelp effectively asks anybody to be a critic on everything. It has stars, rankings, not just for bars and restaurants, as you were mentioning. Go look up the Yelp page of the Vietnam War Memorial. 
People create Yelp pages for everything. For White House, for singular works of art sometimes. Anything that is, you know, on the National Mall usually has enough patriotism in people's mind to filter it so they are usually at four and a half star out of five. It's always fascinating to read to see who doesn't get the full, give the full five stars. Many of them are actually based on criteria of beauty. They say things like, this memorial looks smaller in, in person than I thought. So a three star. <laughs> Obviously and thankfully, the, the mall was not designed and still is not accountable to Yelp soon. Incidentally, Yelp, uh, before I thought rate my professor was bad, but Yelp is the address for professor. The issue here is that democracy has a conceptual tension within itself. Liberal democracy elevates it to a symptomatic level where every individual is championed, asked to be, in fact, told that is an exceptional person. The very nature of the system, I do this in my theories of democracy class, I tell my students that if you were to pause and just for a moment, not to give it standing ovation to the word democracy, just when you hear it. If you were to just conceptualize it almost as a sci-fi thing, as in you came from an Earth planet, and you asked about how does your system of governance work, and we tell them it's very, it's the very best there is. Here's how it works. You're born, you survive 18 years, you don't kill yourself, and there you are. Whatever you say is as good as anybody else. That's how we think it works. As long as you are, you still have a pulse by the age of 18 and didn't commit a crime, you're as good as any SBA professor, SIS professor. In fact, since you gotta draw the line somewhere. <laughs> Come on. I was hoping somebody would draw the line somewhere, but there is. So the democratic age, on the one hand, champions people, emboldens them to say, what you think individually matters, and at the same time, yes, indeed, it goes anti-intellectual, it goes anti-classics, it goes anti-cutting edge, unless the cutting edge, as Mr. Kimball rightly pointed out, gets reabsorbed into the mainstream. Like the way they sell jeans that are already cut. That can happen too. All of these things, there is no stopping it, except maybe stopping democracy, but somebody looking like me should never say that. So, <laughs> I'm not gonna go there. Instead, since I can't talk bad about democracy, I will say something else. I'm going to say that instead of democracy requiring art to adjust itself to it, art needs indeed to stop cowering to the democratic demand. And here is the point where Mr. Kimball and I are going to defer. Because I do believe that to do so, it has to be political. Because democracy is increasingly apolitical. Politics is not just an assembly of single individual opinions gathered together. It has to have something more to say. It has to have a conversation to have. None of these things are happening. And the fact that the artists are now reduced to Cutting-edge provocateurs is not a good thing. 
And it's not the way, effectively, arts can grab attention. So I will, in fact, defend the artist's right to be political insofar as it should not go for immediacy. When Duchamp indeed did that, it had its very limited success, partly because his target was the art world. He wanted to criticize the world of the museums, their logic, their approach to things. I have never been really part of that world, and it's not interesting to me. The democratic world is more interesting. What I hear in the world immediacy and the immediate beauty is immediate, as in the medium is hidden. That the mediation of life is hidden. This has been, and used certainly to be, one of the greater inspiration of artists, which was to expose everyday life, to bring to light that which is hidden, to show it, not to mock it, not to denigrate it, not to necessarily elevate it, but to simply bring it to light, to show that that which you would not notice otherwise has in effectively even inherent beauty. If politics absorbs the arts, arts will be condemned to this race of let's be novel, and you see this with campaigns. How many novel ideas do they have? It's not particularly productive. If artists are trying to do this, trying to compete like campaigners or primaries, yeah, we get very strange results in the arts. But if the goal of art is to be able to take that step back, is to be able to look at the given, at that which is so simply, like a purloined letter, hidden before our eyes, I consider that thoroughly a political gesture. As in, art becomes arresting, but not because it's shocking. It becomes beautiful, but not just for the sake of old beauty and its Christian or any other heritage. But it brings ordinary life, the very stuff that supports and drives us every day, too light, too bare. You see, I, I would never go as far as propaganda. I think on this one we disagree only because I think propaganda is too strong a term in this case. Propaganda usually is very, very exaggerated to the point that most people actually see it. I have lived under several propaganda regimes and they make fascinating arts, there is no doubt, but usually you cannot, everybody around knows it. My favorite, I can't never not mention this because this was the most awesome propaganda I've ever seen. I saw Saddam Hussein propaganda for a while. That was so good. Because on every building around Baghdad, and bear in mind I'm Iranian, I was there running away from Iran and their politics, so it was not a happy place. Either way, especially during the Iran Iraq war. So at almost every corner, he had paintings, beautiful, meticulous paintings, made of himself, performing different jobs different tasks. So you had Saddam the carpenter, Saddam the doctor, Saddam the teacher. Those were stunning, beautiful, 10-story high propaganda art dish. I don't know. Nobody, even the artists who did that, probably they were happy to have the job because it was a lot of pain to do, but I suspect that most Iraqis realize this is insane. He doesn't have to, he can't do these jobs. <laughs> what I consider something political, and the, the kind of art that touches you guys the most, and I'm biased toward it favorably, is film. Because film 
has the capacity to bring the kind of nuances through characters and situations that effectively do complicate politics. By that, I don't mean you watch something and you say, wow, there is so much here, I don't know what to think anymore, so I'm done thinking. What I mean is that the age of democracy, but its radical emphasis on the genius of the individual has deflated attention from anything that could stand out because it's almost too unknown. There is a flattening effect of conformism that is happening in liberal democracies that is effectively a danger to itself and every thinker of the tradition has been warning against it. That is just something we have known. What we hadn't anticipated throughout philosophy is that apparently just telling people, okay, be careful not to be too full of yourself is not enough. People tend to do that apparently. So the goal of the arts for me is that it's absolute worse not when it's trying to be too provocative, but when it's trying to be too collaborative without any sense of reflection on the matter. My favorite example of really spectacularly bad art that not, was nauseating far more than those cans of, how many cans, 30, or number of cans there were, was the new series of Batman movies. Sacrilege, I heard. I heard the song. No way. No way. It was absolutely beautiful. And you don't go in there expecting a foreign film with subtitles and you know some something that requires you to wear a black collar and pretend that it was deep just going for the entertainment, and that's fine. And we have the same tropes that Batman had 30, 40 years ago. And this time, the beauty of it was, and I mean it, the beauty of it was that it made the assumptions a lot more clear. It showed you that China is a supplier of a lot of stuff that Batman keeps blowing up that there are all these chains of global demand. The globalization is behind Batman. Before it looked mysterious, it just it popped out of nowhere and it just had all this stuff. They actually started explaining some of it. They actually showed, they demystified it almost, that no single individual does this, that there is somebody else paying a price for this greatness and I thought at that moment this was a genuine shift in the Batman series. That we were learning something new about where these cars are made. Who's making them? What kind of labor does it take to do this? But it came this close and then took it back. It went back to the same narrative that your government is weak. There is always one good intention cop who tries to help but fails. The rest of them are corrupt. And all, and you won't see it because Batman, as Bruce Wayne during the day, looks like a decadent 1% guy. But you should just trust it that come nighttime, rich people will put on their tights and save the world. <laughs> and here we are. This is as nauseating to me as it gets, as a message that undermines the actual democratic citizenship that disempowers them to do anything about that government except wait for this mysterious bad signal. It doesn't reveal anything to us. Almost it started to get there. And then it withdrew it. When I say art has to be political, it doesn't have to be a political message I agree with. When I say that if art has a role to play in politics, in democratic politics, is to bring to bear matters that otherwise democratic citizens are unwilling 
by democratic impulse to engage. The democratic impulse values your opinion as you are. You're very precious just by existing. And it gives you this myth of informed citizen. Like, I'll read up on my own and I'll figure out. It takes taking half a class of sociology to figure out that it just doesn't work this way. Or some psychology that you don't have that much power. I love Descartes, but you don't sit there and reinvent the world by yourself. So if art conceals, it's bad. If it's the concealment on top of it is a beautiful, gorgeous fantasy, then I'm against beauty. And I don't think that art should serve the citizen in that sense. The way I see art work as a last conclusion in terms of its function, in terms of its model, is the commitment of artists and art lovers too. They are a far better model as functional identities than democratic ones. If you are an art lover, you always go to art galleries, you always keep thinking about it. You don't wait every four years to say, it's been a while since I've gone to a gallery, I should, I should probably do this for four minutes. If you are an artist, you don't say, I'm just going to wait for another free vacation I have to start thinking. You make time for it because you live and breathe it. And what democracy needs is to have that impact is that you have to have politics as something that you take on more seriously than every couple of years to sort of bring back to say, okay, let me remind myself of the important issues, or let the important issues be hidden just by the dribble that we have, by the noise everywhere. The task of democracy is fundamentally artistic because democracy is an open-ended system that is capable of creations that no other system is capable of making. And very much like the art world in that sense, democracy could turn out very banal because it has the power of creation and it could just you know, do the Warhol. It doesn't work.